Welcome back, everybody, to The Social Brain. Uh, God, I can't believe we're, we've done 25 episodes now. Thank you, everybody, for continuing to watch and listen. We absolutely love doing the show and just talking about all this, this brainy stuff that's super interesting, giving you guys insight into your own mind so that you can make kind of healthy and productive decisions about your life and things like that. Uh, so uh, I am Taylor Guthrie, and I run the ch channel The Cellular Republic. This is my awesome co-host, Andrew Cooper Sansone, and he runs the channel Sense of Mind. Uh, so please, please give us a like and subscribe on our channels. Um, but we're also trying to figure out how to, how to keep this show going. So if you guys uh, enjoy watching us and you have any ability to help us out at all, you can consider uh, joining our, our Patreon. Uh, we have these QR codes on the screen. Uh, we also just started an online store. So we have like official social brain stickers and cool like brain shirts and things like that. And that should actually be like underneath our, our YouTube channel. So uh, anything that, that you all can do to help us, we'd greatly appreciate it. But moving on now, we will get into the show and talk about something that's that's really cool and kind of not talked about a lot, and that's sleep and how amazing kind of the whole process of sleep actually is. Yeah, and I think I want to start out by saying sleep is kind of this weird, almost like paradoxical thing, if you think about it, because it seems like totally natural. Like you, you want to go to sleep every night. I personally don't want to stop sleeping in the morning and just can't get enough of it. But most people, most of us kind of don't, don't really have any idea what's going on inside our heads when like, why do we have this urge to sleep? Why do we sleep? What is sleep in the first place? Um, it seems really mysterious. And then like, there's even more kind of mysteries that go along with it. Like if you think of it in an evolutionary sense, uh, humans and all other kind of mammals and animals, really, we all evolved to survive. And part of survival is avoiding danger and predation. And yet for, you know, a third to a half of the day, we are just kind of in this, you know, offline, so to speak, state, this sleep state. And so there's got to be some really important evolutionary function of sleep for us to just shut off basically and uh, <laughs> to not be able to do all the things that are beneficial to survival. Um, and then also dreaming. Dreaming is just this weird thing that seems like we're, we all just take it for granted. Like, oh yeah, I'm just going to go to sleep and then be in a totally different world with different laws of physics, different rules. Um, we, you know, very rarely do we know that we're dreaming, even though all this stuff is is off, it doesn't seem right, or it's illogical, absurd. Um, and yet, even in that that state, it's not uncommon to solve like complex problems. Like I remember when I was taking chemistry course in college, I I couldn't get my mind around this concept. It just wasn't clicking. And I went to sleep thinking about it. And then in the morning, I woke up and it was just clear. I had this epiphany while I was dreaming that, okay, well, that's how it works. And it was just, but I, you know, I had to go through some kind of process of reasoning and yet my brain's in this weird sleep state. And anyway, I'm, I'm kind of bringing this up because I just want to get you thinking about what is sleep? Why do we have this? What's the evolutionary function of it? And then how can we get more sleep? What are the benefits of sleep? How can we improve our sleep? And uh, throughout this episode, we're going to be talking about all of this, how the brain uh, generates and uh, goes into sleep and what's its evolutionary function. And then at the end, we'll kind of talk about some evidence-based strategies and tools for improving your sleep. And I think, uh, I mean, we'll talk a little bit of it about this at the, the end of the episode when we get into maybe some strategies for, for sleep. But uh, if you, if you want to know what the best stress relief is, it's sleep. Uh, the best trauma release is sleep. Best immune booster is sleep, right? This was pulled from uh, an Amber, Andrew Huberman tweet. Uh, the best hormone augment, augmentation, sleep. The best emotion stabilizer, sleep, right? This is something that is incredibly beneficial to us that so many of us uh, take for granted. Um, we're oftentimes, I mean, we're in a hustle culture. Like that's, that's, that's what we live in. It's this grind that we're constantly on of just trying to accomplish things over and over and over again, uh, to the point where we're keeping ourselves up. 
and not able to go to sleep because we're just ruminating about all of these things that we need to accomplish, right? Um, and so I think what's really important throughout this episode is to really reflect on how important that whole process is in terms of your long-term health goals, right? Because all of us are going to get older, all of our joints are going to start to break down, right? Uh, and anything that makes those years at the end a little bit more comfortable is going to be something you're like thanking your previous self for. Definitely. And in, just in addition to that, it's so important for learning and memory. And we all kind of know what that's like if you've had a poor night of sleep or you didn't sleep at all. Uh, the next day, you are not as sharp. You're not able to remember things. You, If you learned something the day before, you probably won't be able to recall it as well the next day. So there's this function of sleep in, in learning and memory that we'll get into as well. So even for your short-term goals, in addition to the, the long-term health benefits that Taylor's just saying, um, it's, it's really important. So maybe we should dive into like what sleep is. And I think the, a, a good kind of all encompassing definition is that sleep is a set of brain states, a set of dynamic brain states that allows the brain to repair damage, restore function and reorganize neural connections. And that kind of gives you that preview of why this is so important. Um, but yeah, I, I guess that that's kind of the, the baseline definition. No, and I mean, what you just laid out was it was kind of the, the scientific kind of wording for, for what we were laying out in terms of sleep is really good for health benefits, right? Because it's it's part of this, this cleaning process. It's part of this repair process. Um, but it's also really important for all of our cognitive functions because of what Andrew was just saying in terms of neural reorganization, that there has to be some type of process that allows us to put like disparate ideas together and to play around with ideas in a way that our normal cognition probably gets in the way of. Yeah, yeah, that's a really great point. And it kind of leads us to why sleep evolved in the first place. What is its evolutionary function? What are the benefits, uh, the adaptive benefits that it confers on, on animals? And um, the, the first way that you can see that sleep is important for survival is just a brute fact about it, that if you don't sleep, if you just completely uh, get rid of sleep from your life, the evidence is that you will die eventually. <laughs> um, uh, within a yeah. pretty short term, not not like eventually, eventually, like, yeah, yeah. It, it, things break down pretty soon. You have a even if you just are sleep deprived, you have a higher uh, mortality risk. But that doesn't really tell us why that's the case. And what we were just alluding to with the definition of sleep is that there there are kind of multiple ideas about what the evolutionary benefits of sleep are, but like we're saying, they, they all kind of converge on this idea of brain repair and neural reorganization. So repairing the cells and tissues of the brain and also uh, facilitating the kind of neuroplasticity involved in learning and memory. Um, but that begs this question, why shut down normal cognition? Why do we have to go into this weird state in order for our brains to repair themselves? Yeah. And I think, I mean, one of the, the really interesting things that I think really stands out for me uh, is the fact that so many of these neuroplastic processes that are occurring in terms of consolidation of memory, of really laying down like strong connections between neurons and like strengthening connections and all of these things, those processes probably are kind of in conflict with normal cognitive function that when those when those circuits are actually being used for information processing for normal cognition and thinking about the world you can't do this so it's it's like uh, imagine driving down the highway right like it, you can drive down the highway in the day but like if it's all shut down for construction like there's no driving down that road right you need to shut things down in order to really kind of build a better structure around it to then allow the traffic to flow more freely the next day yeah and it, and and that's that is the main reason. But I guess people might wonder, like, well, it seems like, you know, wounds, your your wounds, if you got a wound on your body, a cut or something yeah. that seems to heal. You know, why does the if you're not asleep? So why does the brain why do brain cells have to have this time to uh, to kind of like shut down this this normal cognition? And 
I, I guess the, Taylor's explanation is really good because it, it also points to this, this other kind of cellular explanation that is like neurons are pretty much, I think this is true. The only type cell type in your body that doesn't uh, self replicate. And that's typically how, like how a wound heals is cells multiplying and, and filling the space where that, that cut was um, and uh, forming new tissue. But in the brain, you know, throughout the day, throughout normal cognition, you're having a buildup of uh, metabolites of, of free radicals that are doing like little small amounts of damage to cells throughout the day, um, just kind of adding up. And so neurons can't just like make a new neuron when one's damaged. So they have to actually uh, repair like piece by piece the, the damage that occurs throughout the day. So that's one explanation of why we have to actually shut down because you might imagine that if if you were awake and just starting to form new neurons throughout the brain, again, this would be problematic for normal waking cognition. No, I I think that's that's a, a really good way to think about it. I think there was a uh, there was an interview that we watched preparing for this with Gina Poe, and she kind of gave the analogy of uh, when you're awake, your brain is like having a party, right? People are dropping their solo cups on the table, and like there's stuff all over the floor or whatever. Uh, if you want to then throw another party the next day, uh, you have to shut that party down. You got to kick everybody out to clean up all of that debris and to, to kind of collect all of that stuff. And if you just keep having parties without cleaning up, then people are stepping over stuff. They're stepping on each other, right? Things are getting clogged up. Uh, things are just not flowing as easily as they can. And we'll kind of get into, I think we'll transition a little bit into this, this idea of kind of slow wave kind of synchrony, which is really interesting because I, I think some some people may have kind of picked up on on the idea that like, OK, well, why not just shut down like certain regions at a time? Why shut down like everything at once? Uh, and that could be the case that there's something going on with the synchrony that happens at night, this kind of slow wave activity when we're in this deep sleep, this restorative sleep process um, that might require all of the neurons being off at the same time. Right. Yeah. And um, I'm just going to note uh, this question we got in the chat while we're yeah. we're talking here uh, from Rahil said that uh, asked how sleep, how can sleep influence stress induced neuroplasticity, uh, the phase that occurs during exams? Um, that's a good question. We'll have to we'll probably circle back to the answer of yeah. that one yeah. uh, and it'll start to become clear what throughout what we talk about. But as Taylor's saying, there's this slow wave activity that is is super important for the processes of, of repair and of cleaning kind of the, the metabolites out of the brain, the toxins that build up during the day. And um, I guess this this sort of can can bring us to uh, maybe some of the, the neuroscience of sleep, how it actually how it works. But um, I'm sorry, do you want to say anything more on that, Taylor? No, I mean, I think we can we can circle back to some of the the stages. I think because uh, we're we're still in this stage of like thinking evolutionarily about where this stuff came from, right? Um, and when you really think back to some of these these first animals uh, that developed neural systems, like cnidarians, jellyfish, all of these things, uh, they were these neural nets. It was just this net of neurons, and they were all kind of just firing in synchrony with one another, and they were they were doing it to kind of propel the animal and to kind of move fluid. Uh, and what you see is something really similar during slow wave sleep is that each of our neurons, and this is, there's not a lot of clear evidence on this, but there's some interesting kind of speculation about this, about how when neurons fire, they, they expand and contract. And if you have all of the neurons at the same time expanding and contracting together, it's actually acting like a bilge pump, which is pumping stuff out of your brain. And there's a series of channels in your brain that are kind of lymphatic. Uh, so they're involved in kind of draining toxic stuff out and bringing all of the, the garbage that you've accumulated throughout the day, like Andrew was saying. Uh, those channels open up by, I think, like 60% during these like deep, slow wave sleep kind of periods. And so you have all of this neural activity that's kind of causing this physical kind of exertion in terms of like bilge pump activity and then all these channels opening up. So it flushes all of this crap out of your brain. 
Um, and there's really interesting links to things like, like Alzheimer's and dementia with these beta amyloid plaques that you see like those accumulate throughout the day when we're in normal function. Um, but then at night, it's part of this washing process that washes all that stuff out. And they've seen that people that have sleep deprivation, that have sleep apnea problems and things like that, there's actually this inability to drain a lot of that stuff. And then you have this accumulation over time that ends up becoming a problem. And that can be associated with, with Alzheimer's because mm -hmm. Alzheimer's seems to be um, a neurodegenerative disease that is uh, kind of metabolic in nature, that there's these... Uh, these plaques and tangles that develop in the brain and kind of uh, start to clog up the, the workings of the brain. And um, many of those can be washed out in this slow wave activity that we're talking about. And, um, and it, I guess one more thing on evolution that I wanted to note that like what Taylor was saying was there are these, there's this really interesting idea that sleep evolved before wake, which I find just like that blew my mind when I started <laughs> learning about it. And at first you're like, well, why, what, is, what do you mean? Like that doesn't really make much sense. But, but like we're talking about the slow wave activity seems to kind of resemble the uh, sort of proto animals, the early animals that were um, the, the Cnidarians, the sort of jellyfish like creatures that seem to be some of the earliest um, uh, have evolved nervous systems first, basically. Um, but there's other there's other like um, uh, correlations that kind of bring this picture of, of sleep evolving first into focus, which is like neuromodulators, so neurotransmitters that are important in maintaining wake, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, ones like norepinephrine and dopamine we talked about on this channel are also important in motivated behaviors in the kind of stuff that you do. Uh, in during wake the moving around um and so there's this link between wake related behaviors and these neuromodulators that keep us awake um and then and then on the other hand there's uh neuromodulators that promote sleep and those may be more important for kind of passive activity things like serotonin um as a small aside, serotonin is the precursor to melatonin, which is one of the main hormones that uh, causes us to uh, feel sleepy and, and go to sleep. Um, and then lastly, just uh, I find this interesting that if you think about plants and fungi, right, they, they uh, arguably kind of dominate the earth and they get along just fine without uh, wake, without moving around in the world. So why not you know, the early animals as well. Uh, so there's, there's some ideas about whether sleep did or didn't evolve before wake <laughs> and what that really even means. Um, but anyway, I just, I find that really interesting. No. And I think something, uh, and I think this is a nice transition point too, because I think something that, that really kind of runs the thread through a lot of what you were just saying is that sleep tends to be more of a default state. It's something that we fall back into, right? Uh, if we could, we would, especially in this hustle culture we're a part of, we would want to just like stay awake and do all the things that we need to accomplish and all of this stuff. But we we can't because we're pulled back into this sleep state and back into this restorative state. And I think that that's that really kind of leads us into kind of what are these driving forces that that are really kind of controlling that process of, of making us sleepy, of causing us to, to then kind of fall back into these these kind of synchronous brain states and things like that. Um, and it looks like there's there's these two kind of processes going on. Um, and I'll let uh, Andrew speak to some of those too, but uh, sleep homeostasis and circadian rhythms. And so a lot of people have probably heard about circadian rhythms, right? We have we have clocks. Uh, in our body. I mean, I have a three-year-old. His clock is tuned. Like he is up at 6.30 every morning. Like, <laughs> right. Uh, it's it's one of these things. We So there's a, a part of our brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's like one of the, the coolest brain names. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it is it is something that programs itself based on the, the level of light. Um, it, it takes cues from temperature, from body temperature and all of these things to, to really set all of the rhythms in our body. And I think that it's really important to, to really kind of cue in and understand the fact that our body is incredibly rhythmic, 
like all of the, the hormone releases that we go through, all of these physiological processes within cells and cell regeneration and DNA repair, all of these things are on timers. They're on cycles, right? And the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the, in the kind of, I think it's in the thalamus. Uh, uh, hypothalamus, I think. Yeah, yeah. hypothalamus um, is kind of the dominant clock. It's the one, uh, it's kind of like the, the main clock that rules them all. Uh, that sets all of these other ones into motion. Right. And it, it does that yeah. by um, typically by, by hormone release that, that kind of tunes all the other cells in the body to this clock. And, um, and so like, that's, that's one half of our sleep. Uh, why we sleep. We have these clocks, these sort of hormone and, and gene expression timers, as, as Taylor put it, that, that happen once a day that keep us on this really regular rhythm. And then there's uh, this, as Taylor mentioned, there's this second uh, half of kind of what causes us to sleep or feel sleepy, um, which is referred to as sleep homeostasis. And it's just the idea that it or it's the based on the observation that the more time we spend awake is the greater the difficulty in staying awake and the longer time we spend asleep once we do go to sleep. And, and this is, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 yeah, if you want to take it, go for it. No, I was just saying, this system is fascinating. Uh, and it's something that, like, I didn't really even know much about. Uh, Andrew's got great videos on all of this stuff, by the way, on his channel, on kind of a lot of the, the neural circuitry involved in a lot of this that we're not going to go super deep into in this episode, um, but also on caffeine and what caffeine does with this system. Uh, because it's all centered around the fact that we're using energy. And if uh, if you guys haven't taken like a microbiology class or whatever, uh, there's a molecule called ATP, which is like the currency for energy in the body. Uh, and whenever we do anything that requires energy, we're breaking down ATP and we're using the, the kind of release that breaks, breaking down ATP gives us to do that molecular work. Um, and the homeostasis kind of pathway is all modulated by the byproduct of that. Yeah. And it's, um, it's exactly as Taylor's saying, using this energy, it's like, that's the key because, um, throughout the day, while you're, you're acting in the world, you're using a lot of ATP just to, you know, move your muscles and think through problems and, and everything else that you do. And this, the, the most, uh, widely kind of, um, accepted hypothesis, or at least uh, with a lot of evidence, is this idea that we're talking about that um, throughout the day, ATP breaks down into it's uh, when, when it's used, it turns into um, adenosine, or it, it, that's one of the byproducts. And adenosine is actually a neuromodulator molecule. It's a neurotransmitter. And if you've learned about caffeine or watched my video on caffeine, you know that adenosine when it binds to its receptors, makes us feel sleepy. And uh, caffeine blocks that interaction. And so that's why caffeine keeps you from falling asleep and makes you feel a little more awake and alert. And so as, but as in the normal course of things, as adenosine builds up throughout the day, you get this accumulation of this neuromodulator that makes you feel sleepier and sleepier and sleepier throughout the day. So that's kind of, one of the the more widely accepted ideas about what uh, this sleep homeostasis, the, this like observation that the longer you're awake, the more um, uh, the more you sleep when you do get to sleep, and the more tired you are throughout the day, uh, th that may be the origin of that. And I like really kind of reflect on this for a minute because it's it's fascinating, right? Because this is one of the coolest feedback me mechanisms I've ever learned about, right? you are doing cognitive work. You're doing physical work throughout the day, right? Think about the times when you're doing like yard work all day or some kind of physical labor, you have a really hard job. Like you're really tired after that, right? And it's because you've been breaking down a ton of ATP, right? You've been using that to facilitate all of this energy that you're using to do all of the work that you do throughout the day. And I mean, our, our brain uses 25% of our energy, right? So if you're doing a ton, ton of cognitive work, right? Even if you're not out in the sun, like toiling and, and, and shovels of dirt or whatever, uh, you doing cognitive work, thinking through complex problems is also using a ton of this ATP. And the more work you do, the more byproduct is created, the more adenosine is created, which then makes you more and more sleepy. 
And caffeine is not giving you energy. It's just blocking the brain's ability to measure how much adenosine is in the brain. Like, yeah. it's just saying, we're not really sleepy. Just ignore that, right? That's uh, true. Fascinating. Uh, I did want to, we have, we have a couple of comments uh, in the chat. Uh, so one of them can sleep fix negative thoughts. Uh, I think we're going to kind of circle back to this one when we talk a little bit about dreams and things like that. Um, it's not an easy answer. Uh, I think a lot of it requires intention uh, going into sleep and things like that. Um, but we have another uh, question from from Bruce. If I understand right, the waking state seems to have originated as a short burst fight or flight type state used only when needed, then was advantageous to use for more often and for longer periods. I, I love this question. I really do. Uh, because so much of how I think about the brain and how I think about a lot of these states uh, is this kind of the seesaw that we're on of either being like active and engaged and trying to accomplish things or being in this kind of rest and digest situation of really kind of calming things down, allowing for the transportation of resources for repair processes and all of these things. And these are at odds so much of the time. And if you think back to what we were talking about in terms of evolution, in terms of the sleep being kind of the default state, then what ends up happening is that you have this these jellyfish, they have this synchronous activity that's allowing them to move or whatever. But then the, the animal learns that if a couple of neurons over here start to fire for very specific things in the environment, for detecting threat or for detecting food or whatever it is, it allows then for a modified type of behavior that is considered a wakeful behavior, right? And then as you go through evolution and as these kind of behaviors become more complex for uh, uh, approach goals and avoidance goals and all of these things, you then develop this entire repertoire that's then kind of uh, folded into the sympathetic nervous system, which is involved in kind of the fight or flight and the active engagement of things, right? Um, and what I've kind of been hinting at through a lot of this episode is this kind of hustle culture type idea that we are actually kind of over engaging that side most of the time. I mean, this is a huge source of so many of the, the mental illnesses that we experience with anxiety, with depression. We're in these just like super heightened cortisol release kind of modes because we think that we need to be active all the time, that we need to be accomplishing things, that we need to be finding some sense of control in our environment and achieving our goals. And that's what turns into all of these like ruminative thoughts and all of these things. When really what the research suggests is that we need to shut all that crap down. Like we need to let our body just be in its default state and go through the process of repair. And like, it's, it's us getting in the way of that, that prevents a lot of this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, I love that. And I just wanted to, to uh, just comment on Blue's question about can sleep fix negative thoughts? Yeah, we will get into that about the, the, uh, crucial role of REM sleep in, um, in kind of trauma therapy and yep. in re releasing trauma. And so if, if those are the kinds of you know, negative thoughts that you're referring to, I think there is good uh, reason to believe that sleep is definitely involved in that process. And all these things that Taylor's talking about that, you know, we, we fall for these, this illusion that sleep or that yeah, sleep is just a wasted time. You can sleep when you're dead. Well, guess what? You can't sleep when you're dead because you're dead and you can't do anything. So and you're going to be dead a lot sooner. <laughs> That's true. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we should uh, get a little transition from, okay, so now what causes us to start to feel sleepy? It's this circadian rhythms combined with sleep homeostasis, buildup of adenosine. Um, and now, what is sleep? What is what is the difference between wake and sleep and the different stages of sleep? Yeah, and this this is really fascinating stuff. Um, I think if you want to go, why don't you cover these these first couple of ones, then we'll maybe jump into like sleep spindles and stuff like that, because that stuff's Sweet. really cool. Yeah. So um, most of the research that's been done on sleep is uh, uses EEG, which is an electroencephalogram, and it's basically just looking at pretty much the whole um, electrical, act acti electrical activity of the entire brain. And they put these kind of caps on people that are have electrodes that are sensing um, changes in uh, electrical activity, which correlate with the kinds of neuronal firing patterns that we've been talking about here. So I'm just going to kind of run through what the differences are and what 
uh, between wake and the different sleep stages and what it tells us about what's going on in the brain. And so in wake, what you see in the EEG is typically um, you see a lot of kind of, for lack of a better term, disorganized um, neural activity. It's not synchronized, it's asynchronous. And they are, there's just a lot of kind of messiness in the, the signal. Um, and I'm obviously simplifying this, but um, then in, in sleep, typically the, the kind of thing that seems to unite the different stages of sleep is um, there's more synchrony among neurons, even so, especially in NREM. And NREM is the main, um, the, the, the stage of sleep that especially adults, we spend most of our time in NREM sleep. And NREM stands for non-rapid eye movement. Um, and, and then there's this other type of sleep called REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement sleep. The name for that came from observations of uh, people when they were asleep. This is one of the first ways that they differentiated how uh, between the sleep stages was that REM showed this weird rapid eye movement while people were sleeping. But regardless, uh, in NREM, you see these, uh, especially in stage three, which is kind of the um, the dominant stage, especially early on in the night, you see these big rolling waves of highly synchronized activity. And what that's telling us is this is the slow wave activity that we've been talking about. This is the, the synchronization of vast populations of neurons firing all in sync, doing that kind of pumping action that, that Taylor was talking about. And so that is very different from wake. But then when you get to REM sleep, which REM sleep is most closely associated with dreaming. So you, we tend to have like our most vivid and um, kind of uh, memorable dreams in REM. And uh, REM tends to, to start to dominate later in the night. We start to have more bouts of REM sleep later on in the night. And I don't know about you, but for me, like I typically remember my dreams most uh, right after I wake up in the morning or late in the night. Um, and the weird thing about REM compared to NREM is that REM looks pretty similar to wake in the EEG. And uh, the, the difference being it's more synchronized, uh, but it is it resembles wake, which kind of makes sense when you think about, you know, your experience of dreaming is kind of similar to your waking cognition, right? And so there's there's maybe some similarity going on there between those stages and helping to explain, you know, what, what dreams are like. So let's, uh, let's dig into this a little bit because yeah. uh, there's some, some really interesting kind of distinctions between these different stages. Uh, and I think one of the things to highlight first is some of the limitations of, of EEG. Uh, cause what we're looking at with an EEG is scalp recording. So we're just recording kind of, uh, really kind of population level activity, uh, lots and lots of neurons firing. That's why this is really important for sleep research is because so much of the, the activity in sleep is this synchronous activity. Um, I remember doing EEG studies in undergrad, uh, when I was working in a lab and it was, it was fascinating. You could tell exactly when a participant was getting sleepy and was potentially about to fall asleep because your study was too boring. Like <laughs> I was like, oh, there's there's some alpha waves, like oh, they're getting sleepy. Uh, and you just you see that their their brain is just dipping into this uh, this thing. But what EEG is not really good at is it's not good at telling us what's going on in subcortical stuff. So it's it's telling us a lot about what's happening kind of on the cortical level, um, and that might be mixed with signals that are coming from the deep brain uh, because it's it's like putting your a cup up to the door and trying to hear what's going on, but not really being able to pinpoint where exactly those signals are coming from. Um, but I think what's really fascinating about all of this is this idea of synchrony. Um, Cause like, it's, it's just fascinating. I mean, imagine your neurons, not as these like individual cells, but as like animals. Right. And you have like these, like a million animals all getting together and just like doing some type of like movement together <laughs> in this like coordinated fashion. It's this, it's this mind blowing like picture that you can have in your mind. Um, but I think when you're distinguishing that from wakefulness, right. <clears throat> wakefulness is a period of information processing. 
And so when you really think about what's going on on the EEG in wakefulness, there's there's all of this just chatter. There's tons of activity going on. And that's because it's you have this region over here is processing this kind of information and this one's talking to it about this and this one's inhibiting emotions and this one's doing that and this one's doing. And so what you're picking up on the EEG is just all of this cross chatter of all of these different brain regions trying to put all of these different things together, trying to understand the moment, trying to predict what's coming next, right? Um, and so it's really fascinating to then kind of reflect on what sleep is then, is that it's all of that just stopping, right? It's, it's we're not trying to process anything. We're not trying to make sense of the information. We're just allowing all of our neurons to just kind of sing kumbaya together, like, and like get into this, just like this kind of almost like <laughs> transient state, right? Yeah, you can imagine your neurons as a choir all singing together <laughs> right? in oh. versus during the wakefulness, they're all kind of talking and having their own little conversations with each mm -hmm. other. And we got this con this uh, question from Bruce, is NREM like uh, consolidation and synchronization, synchronizing of information while REM is testing new versus old information to try and predict unknowns? That's, uh, this, yeah, not a bad way to characterize yeah. it. it. There's a little uh, more nuance to it that we'll get to actually in just a second. But um, but yeah, I mean, especially the part about NREM consolidation and synchronization of information, uh, there's there's something to that for sure. And I think that's a, that's a good place to, to jump into right now because um, what we, what we see is this progression through these stages of more and more relaxation of our body getting into a relaxed state, our muscles losing a lot of tension, right? Uh, you have this experience of falling asleep. Uh, something that I, I found kind of fascinating in this research was I thought that dreams only happened during REM sleep, but that is not the case. Dreams happen through the entire cycle, um, but it's the, the quality of the dreams, right? The dreams in REM tend to be very narrative, very like you can talk about this whole thing that happened where as the dreams that are happening in these other states seem, they, they call them hypnagogic. They tend, tend to be kind of hallucinations, hallucinations almost of just like random things and ideas that don't have a lot of things to, uh, and there's this fascinating thing that happens in, uh, in the second stage of sleep, which are called these sleep spindles. And so I don't know if you want to kind of take over Andrew and talk about those because those are um, fascinating. Sure. Yeah. And it's, um, it's, I guess important to note that we we always enter NREM first. And yeah. so if you ever have, like Taylor was saying, that that experience of starting to fall asleep and then you kind of wake up because uh, you feel a sensation of almost like you're falling backward or you're you're falling. Um, that is thought to be the result of these things called sleep spindles, which uh, spindle that that name comes from uh, it's kind of a visual description of, of what the EEG signal looks like when, when you see this. But what it is, is it seems to be these, these, uh, this communication between the thalamus, which is kind of deep in the brain, you're kind of near the brain stem and the cortex. And so there's this, these, uh, uh, the thalamus is kind of driving these, these uh, oscillations in the cortex. Um, and that seems to account for this, this feeling of falling and kind of waking up early in the night, but they're not just sort of a curiosity like, oh, well, that's a sleep spindle. They're really important for learning, for learning and memory. And, uh, and this goes to, to uh, Bruce's question about NREM being uh, important for consolidation and synchronizing information. Um, do you want to yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's there's this really interesting way of thinking about it. So this last episode that we did was all about uh, memory and about kind of uh, reconceptualizing our idea of memory, of not having like a place where memories live. Uh, there's a small caveat to that that we kind of hinted at in our last episode. Uh, and that's that the hippocampus seems to be kind of like the thumb drive for the day, <laughs> right? It's like, it's like yeah. these are the these are the important novel things that happened today. And now we need to like transfer this back into the cortex so that we can activate these memories without necessarily needing the hippocampus to, to tell us where everything is. Um, and what some really kind of fascinating research has, has pointed at with, with rats and things like that uh, is that these sleep spindles seem to be this almost like replay activity of like transferring stuff from the thumb drive to the cortex. And it's kind of like this, like 
it's reactivating a lot of these these circuits, right? And so if you think about the kind of hallucinations that you have when you're going into non-REM, right? I'm like, I'm sure a lot of you have fallen asleep in a boring class, right? And you're like drifting off to sleep and then you like have some like... <laughs> uh, some hallucination about something that happened and all of a sudden you like wake up really fast. Right. <laughs> uh, but a lot of that is what is going on right there is actually you're reactivating those circuits that are important for those memories that you're trying mm. to consolidate because those are, I mean, that's what we talked about on this last episode is that the memory itself is the circuit that was used to actually process that information. Right. And so when you're thinking about this in terms of like, why do we need sleep? You can't reactivate all of this stuff while you're awake, right? There needs to be some type of like separation between reality and consolidation. And like I'm using these circuits right now to just strengthen them so that they're better, so that they're usable, so that that highway is nice and ready to use. Um, but I don't want you to conflate that with reality. Right, <clears throat> right. And and um, yeah, the, just one little uh, anecdote um, there's these really famous studies in, in rats that Taylor was alluding to that um, about uh, where, the, where they'll solve a maze um, mm -hmm. while they're awake, obviously, and they, they figure out this maze. And then while they're asleep, um, I believe the this is uh, they're recording the, the scientists then record activity from the hippocampus, I believe. And they're actually able to show that during sleep and, and I think during these sleep spindles, uh, there is this replay activity in the hippocampus of exactly the pattern that correlates to the rat solving the maze in that, that same circuit being replayed, but it also gets replayed in reverse and it gets replayed, I think it's like seven times faster than, than mm -hmm. normal waking cognition. So yeah, it's just, I find that really interesting that our memories might be not just replayed and kind of reconsolidated, but also maybe in reverse and faster. And maybe that accounts for some of the weird uh, cognitions we have while falling asleep. Yeah. You don't want to like, and it's what he's talking about. Like when you watch the video, it's, it's so cool because like the activity is this like, brr, brr, and it's like, and you see that like the neurons that are firing are the neurons that were the exact pattern of like how it navigated the maze. But instead of it being the whole like two or three minutes, it's just like, this split second. And so think about that from like a waking perspective. If all of a sudden you're activating all of this <laughs> stuff super fast or backwards, like uh, it's confusing, right? And and this is probably one of the reasons too why we don't, well, I mean, one of the reasons is that the hippocampus is asleep during the night, but why we don't remember a lot of this stuff because we're trying to make a distinction between reality and between all of these, these kind of processes, which I think kind of leads into uh, Bruce's second part of that question, if we want to maybe transition into, into yeah, and to REM. REM, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, as, as I mentioned earlier, as you progress into the night, REM becomes more and more common. Early on in the night, you have shorter bouts of REM, um, and then as the night progresses, sleep cycles shift such that REM becomes more um, uh, more common, and. Um, and one thing I found interesting while, while we were doing research for this that was that when when you wake up from sleep, sometimes you feel totally uh, fine, totally kind of awake and, and ready to go. And then other times you feel really groggy and like your brain's not quite working right. And uh, it, it, one of the reasons for that seems to be that if you wake up during NREM sleep, which is this very, again, very weird, very synchronized, very different from wake type of neural activity. If you wake up from NREM, you feel really groggy and weird. Like your brain is still trying to get back to the normal waking cognition. Uh, whereas if you wake up from REM, uh, you feel a lot more uh, just normal, just wake, just rested. And that probably has to do with the fact that REM is so similar to wake compared to NREM at least. I think something too, as we're leading into this, something that we haven't mentioned that was, I think one of the most fascinating things that I came across uh, in this research was that this, this has been proposed for a long time as global brain states that when we're sleeping, the whole brain is in this kind of this pattern of activity or whatever. Uh, and the research is actually showing that that's maybe not the case. 
that for some people, for some situations, if there's a lot of stress induced kind of things going on, uh, that different parts of your brain can be asleep and awake at the same time. Uh, and so you can maybe, and this is, they've seen this in like parasomnia. So a lot of the disorders with sleep, uh, this happens a lot during like the, the deep sleep where people will be uh, uh, up, eyes open, talking to you. Like uh, people have driven cars, they can like cook, they can do all kinds of stuff uh, where they're actually interacting with the world. But the parts of the brain that are involved in inhibition, that are involved in memory, because these people don't have memory of a lot of these things. So the hippocampus is asleep, the frontal lobe is asleep. But the other areas that are driving motion, like basal ganglia and like uh, these emotional centers, interior cingulate, all of these, these areas are like up and active and they're emotional and they're like they're in and they're it, like engaged and they're talking to people and like reacting to stimuli um and i think that was something that was really kind of fascinating to me to think about the fact that our different parts of our brain can go to sleep at different rates and at different times um and this kind of i was i was telling andrew before the show like having a three-year-old uh you see this like when he gets tired it's like your frontal lobe is asleep right now dude. <laughs> <laughs> like, like what is going on uh right uh and it could and i'm i'm i'd be fascinated to see like once we're able to record like over 24 hours to see how certain areas might be dipping out and other ones might be staying online and all of that kind of stuff and that's just i just wanted to put that out as a caveat that like this is not this clear cut kind of global state kind of thing that we're talking about yeah and just to kind of add on to that the 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 kind of inverse is also true that if you're really sleep deprived, there's some evidence that there can be these like islands of of cortic mm -hmm. of uh, brain areas that are asleep while you are mostly awake. The rest of most of your brain's awake, but there's certain areas that are like <laughs> trying to get some shut eye. But um, and also I guess just to throw this in, it's not that weird to to presume that different areas of our brain are asleep and awake at different times because um uh in other species especially uh like dolphins is a good example <clears throat> they sleep with one half of their brain at a time so it wouldn't be uh it wouldn't be unprecedented for that to be the case but to get back to bruce's question about rem Mm -hmm. testing new versus old information and trying to predict unknowns. Um, there is, like we were saying, REM is really associated with these really kind of vivid narrative driven dreams. Um, and it seems this, this comes from uh, the, someone we mentioned in this episode, Gina Poe, she's a, a sleep neuroscientist. And she was, she argues that the, at this time during REM, this is when your brain is kind of opening and comparing sort of your, your understanding of the world, your schemas and, and making connections between them and finding links, uh, between those, those schemas. So that's really, I mean, I think Bruce, you were hitting on that <laughs> to some extent. So, yeah. No, I, I see this as, I mean, this is, this very much ties into a lot of what we talked about on the show in terms of the, the brain's purpose in, in wakefulness is trying to predict what's going to happen next. We're, we're constantly creating a predictive model about what to expect from other people, about what we're going to do in terms of reaching our goals, uh, about all of these things. And in order to do any of this, we need to have conceptual models of the world online, right? It's uh, what are called schema. Uh, in cognitive psychology, uh, you can think about uh, I good example. I've, I've like talked to my wife. My wife is a therapist, and she talks about how like when she's in the therapy room, like all of her tools are online. She doesn't have to like think about them. They're just there, and they're they're useful. They're they're like they're accessible, right? But when she's at home, those aren't necessarily online, right? Uh, and that's just to say that most of our behavior is done through the lens of conceptual knowledge. Right. We're not actually thinking about all of those things while we're acting. Our behaviors are done kind of through that lens, through that model that we have in our head about how the world works and what kind of information is useful in these contexts and all of these kind of things. And I think what's really important to understand in these kind of REM bouts is that uh, you, you see this in kind of uh, the artificial intelligence world right now, too, in terms of how do you make these these models in artificial intelligence more 
accurate and more better at predicting. And a lot of it is just introducing a ton of noise, right? Introducing a bunch of just variables. Uh, and so what is probably happening during REM sleep is that we're, we're just testing possibilities. We're seeing what kind of things are connected to one another. Is there any similarity in the concepts over here to the similarity in the concepts over here? And we're making those connections. And that could be why we have these kind of these weird kind of narrative fanciful dreams um, is because of the fact that we're trying to, to form these these more coherent models about the world. And also why we sometimes seem to solve those like complex problems I was talking about early in the episode. Like if you're you know thinking through a math problem or something and you just can't figure it out, the advice to sleep on it is really not a bad idea because of this, you know, getting out of this normal uh, range of cognition, this normal kind of neural um, situation, and then uh, moving into this more, um, you know, connecting disparate ideas and networks and things that may be going on during REM. Um, and uh, to to kind of bring it back to Blue's question about can sleep fix negative thoughts? I kind of interpreted that as, as something like like trauma. If you're reliving some kind of trauma, um, there is this evidence that that during REM, the uh, brain area that is involved in in releasing norepinephrine, which kind of keeps us awake and importantly helps us learn and and form new uh, neural connections, and is really important for for that process of, of forming consolidating memories that area goes offline during REM sleep. And this seems to help us kind of break down and erase or, or uh, forget information, break down these synapses that are no longer useful to us. And uh, so it, one of the things about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is there's evidence that this area doesn't stop, doesn't go offline during REM sleep. And it may be why, one of the reasons why um, people with PTSD have so much trouble kind of releasing trauma. Yeah, this is a really, really good point. And I think this also kind of ties into Raheel's question from earlier as well, um, is that what a lot of the sleep research has shown is like the importance of these relaxation type techniques and things like that before we go to sleep, uh, especially in the cases of trauma, PTSD and things like that, uh, which actually, I mean, from a trauma informed perspective can actually be really scary of like closing your eyes and trying to meditate or anything like that and being with your feelings. Uh, but anything that you can do to, to try to calm down the stress part of your system of the the really overactive fight or flight type stuff because that's what norepinephrine is involved in norepinephrine is involved in keeping us alert keeping us attentive all of these things and something that was that was really interesting that that andrew was just alluding to is that the the hippocampus is a lot of people refer to it as like a novelty encoding structure in terms of it's it's recognizing things that are new and important that need to then be transferred to long-term memory and what seems to be happening at night when we're in REM sleep is that when norepinephrine shuts off, we're actually able to kind of clear the heart, the, the thumb drive, right? Like hippocampus has been recording all of this new stuff throughout the day, but now we need to kind of wipe that stuff away and kind of separate ourselves from the novelty. It's not new anymore. It's, it's something that's old. It's something that happened in the past. But if norepinephrine is happening while we're dreaming, then we're not actually erasing the thumb drive. And so things that should be distant from us, things that should be in the past, still feel new and present in terms of trauma and emotion and all of these things that we might be experiencing. Um, and from what, from what I've seen and what we've kind of looked at in the research on this uh, is that we don't necessarily know why the locus aurelius and the norepinephrine is still online during REM sleep. Uh, they've seen this in rats that they've induced kind of PTSD type symptoms in, uh, have the same kind of thing going on. Um, but what is really important is that it is part of that sympathetic nervous system of that fight or flight type mechanism. And so anything that you can do in the night kind of leading up to sleep to really bring down that stress. I mean, this ties into Raheel's question about stress and sleep and neuroplasticity during exams and all of these kind of things too, is that you really want to give your body the opportunity to go through all of these cycles in the right manner, right? So for like Raheel's question in exams, like going to sleep at the normal time instead of staying up 
another three hours, uh, that initial bout of like 90 minutes is actually when a lot of the consolidation is happening, when those sleep spindles are going and when we're transferring all of this stuff to the cortex. And so if you're just cramming all night, you're not actually giving your brain an opportunity to lay this stuff down. And then to Blue's question is really more about the other side of this, not the consolidation part, but the erasure part of really kind of uh, getting yourself into so much of a relaxed state that you can give your body the opportunity to kind of distance itself from all of these past memories. That's really great. And I think that that helps us transition into some of the, the tools and strategies. And one that you just mentioned was like weren't super important. Um, we'll, you'll hear a lot about uh, sleep hygiene if you get into this literature at all. And it's like just the idea of having these, these practices leading up to sleep that help your brain and body get into a state that facilitates, you know, falling asleep and staying asleep and getting that, that good rest. And one that Taylor mentioned is sounds super basic, but it relates <laughs> to that circadian rhythms that we were talking about earlier, that uh, our brains are, and our bodies are on these timers, these clocks, and this hormone release is on these, these uh, timers and clocks. And so if you fall asleep, if you go to sleep at the same time every night, you have this, uh, the, the early, the first kind of big, uh, slow wave sleep period yeah. is associated with this release of growth hormone, which helps to form the connections in the hippocampus and, um, facilitates neuroplasticity. And, uh, if you don't go to sleep at that same time, if you wait later, it's not that you just get that growth hormone release later, you actually don't get it. Um, or at least not to the extent as you would if, if you go to sleep at the same time every night. Um, so that first thing, timing, going to waking up and going to bed at the same time every night it is kind of the first principle. And I just want to mention as we go through these tools, uh, these are kind of directly um, <laughs> credited to, to Andrew Huberman, to the Huberman Lab podcast, amazing uh, resource for this kind of thing. But we wanted to kind of spread some of the, the ideas that he, he has propagated. No, and it's, it, it is, it's, it's really great stuff. And I think that there, there is a, a caveat to this that I want to put out before we get into some of these real quick in that uh, there are a lot of people that practice a lot of sleep hygiene and still can't sleep. Uh, and a lot of that is related to kind of mental health type stuff. Um, anxiety is, is strongly related with an initial insomnia, which is the inability to fall asleep early in the night. And it's because you're just ruminating about all of these things that you need to accomplish or that you're worried about or that you're afraid of. Um, and so that kind of brings into this, this whole thing of like having this, this routine, the schedule, uh, doing a, a task list like an hour and a half before bed. So you're thinking about all of this, not right when you're going to bed, but an hour and a half before and doing all these relaxation strategies going up to it. Uh, but there's another insomnia that's uh, a lot more insidious and that's for major depressive disorder. Uh, people tend to wake up at like three o'clock in the morning. Like that is a super common symptom of major depressive disorder. And that has to do actually with the way that major depressive disorder is interacting with a lot of these cycles uh, and is kind of throwing a lot of these circadian rhythms like out of whack. Uh, so I just wanted to put that out as a caveat is that there is a lot of people that when they hear sleep hygiene, they're just like, oh, forget you. Like I try that stuff and it doesn't work. Uh, there's probably some other stuff that you should maybe talk to a clinician about to, to work through. Yeah. But that being said, a lot of this stuff, if you do follow it kind of religiously is pretty amazing in, in how well it can help you sleep. And I will say like, if, if you're able to, if you have the resources and you do uh, experience like really bad insomnia, um, there are sleep physicians and sleep specialists out there that can help you develop kind of a, a, a program for yourself to really help you fall asleep and stay asleep. I mean, I personally know people that had struggled with insomnia their whole life and then went to one of these doctors and followed the, the ritual, followed the, the instructions and did it and, and experienced really amazing improvements in their sleep. Um, but to get to some of the concrete stuff that you can do, uh, again, I want to credit Huberman for this, but, um, but he talks a lot about the, the main thing, one of his, his top tips <laughs> is to view sunlight, get direct sunlight in your eyes by going outside within an hour of waking up. And um, you want to you want to do that because it helps set that circadian clock that we were talking about, helping you to fall asleep later on in the day because that clock is set by these, these light cues. 
Um, and then on, on the flip side, he talks about when the, the sunset, just before sunset, it can be really beneficial to also go outside and get some of that direct light because the different ratios of the wavelengths of the light um, early on the day versus later in the day uh, can help set your clock to allow you to fall asleep uh, when at the normal time. A really good one that, that I personally use a lot, uh, we do in our family, uh, we use nothing but red light at night. Same um, here. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and it's, I, it's kind of like eerie at first. Like I, I walk home uh, from the bus sometimes and it's dark and I see like our bedroom window is just like glowing red, uh, <laughs> but you'll be just like amazed at how calming it is. Uh, and that, that spectrum doesn't affect our circadian rhythm. So we can have red light and it's not affecting us the same way, but also something really important to keep in mind is that our eyes are designed so that the bottom half of our eyes is actually processing light from up in the sky and the top half of our eyes is processing light down below um and so there's actually like a swedish thing that like at night they only use uh lights on the floor um oh, yeah. and it's it's because of the fact that like uh the bottom half of our light uh, of our eyes when it detects light overhead it's thinking that it's the sun up in the sky and so it's messing with the circadian clock and so try to avoid overhead lights at night and just bright lights in general at night yeah and so light is is huge um and uh another one is uh caffeine so uh we talked about how caffeine blocks adenosine receptors and adenosine is super important for that sleep homeostasis for kind of driving the feeling of sleepiness and so uh, he recommends, Huberman recommends avoiding caffeine within eight to 10 hours of bedtime or even longer if you're more sensitive to it. Yep. No. And I think the, the last one that I think is, is really physiological as we kind of wrap some of these up uh, is it's kind of body temperature too, uh, is a huge cue. So, I mean, light and temperature, I think are the main cues that our brain is using to try to understand what's going on in the outside world. Cause when you really think about it, all of the cells in our body have no idea what's going on in the outside world. The only access they have to them is this, that's why this clock, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, I just love saying that word, uh, <laughs> why it is the master clock is because it's the one that actually has access to external stimuli and to internal stimuli and is able to compare all of these and then to set everything else according to it. Uh, and so... Uh, it's connected to, to light receptors that, that are coming in through the eye, uh, but then it's also looking at kind of core body temperature, which rises and falls throughout the day. Um, and so having like cold showers early in the morning is good for waking us up, but then at night being warm and kind of, kind of having a cold environment and kind of warming ourselves up uh, is what's going to promote a lot more of the, the sleepiness type stuff. Yeah, because I believe uh, early in the night, f falling asleep, your body temperature drops uh, fairly mm -hmm. uh, dramatically. And um, so the reason a cold, cold shower wouldn't be uh, good for sleep, for falling asleep, is that then that'll trigger your your body to try mm -hmm. to warm itself up and kind of fight that process. Mm -hmm. yep. Although I, I do take like cool showers before I go to sleep because it just yep. helps me like get the, the, I don't have air conditioning in my house, so it's, it's like <laughs> hot and uh, I just want to like cool down a little bit, but I don't go so cold that I feel that kind of like jolt uh, that yeah, you yeah. might, a, a truly cold shower would do. And that jolt is uh, partly the result of norepinephrine being released. And again, norepinephrine is this main kind of wake promoting yep. neuromodulator. Um, and uh, if if you want to get into kind of the some of the the neural circuitry and like exactly the nuclei that are that are responsible for the kinds of things we're talking about, check out my my video on sleep. I think it's linked in the description of the video on my channel. But regardless, um, there's a couple others we've talked again relating back to norepinephrine and stress is um, you know calming your body and your brain down in whatever way you can is super, super helpful. And uh, having a routine that helps you get into that rhythm can be really helpful. And one thing um, that is is uh, super effective or somewhat effective is these uh, NSDR protocols, the non-sleep deep rest protocols, also called yoga nidra. 
And uh, they're all about uh, kind of progressive relaxation of the body and the mind. And this is actually kind of distinct from your typical mindfulness uh, meditation. And I stress that because mindfulness engages like your attentional systems and this can engage like your prefrontal cortex. And that is associated with autonomic arousal with this kind of waking up this uh, more alert state, um, you know, norepinephrine as, as we've been talking about, <laughs> but whereas these relaxation techniques, this NSDR um, is really focused on just relaxation, not uh, tuning your attentional mechanisms. And I, I think the, the last one that, that I want to get into and cover is the fact that you don't want to do anything to your body that requires your body to do additional work. What you want your body to do at night is to sleep and repair. And so drinking alcohol is causing your body to fight all of the alcohol at night, doing any other kind of drugs, even doing like cannabis. Uh, your body is is mounting a defense against those exogenous chemicals. Uh, and it's causing a lot of resources to get pulled away from these restorative processes that are happening and instead be devoted to, to kind of fighting all of this stuff. And alcohol itself interferes with a bunch of these sleep processes that are going on. And a lot of people use that, that it's just like, oh, I, I can't sleep unless I have a couple of beers or whatever. Um, that's actually very detrimental to the cycles themselves. And you're not actually getting good sleep when you do that. Um, and the other side of that is eating. If you eat a huge meal before you go to sleep, then you're spending tons of resources digesting food at night instead of going through a lot of these restorative processes. So anything that's going to cause your body to do extra work. Uh, but you also don't want to go to sleep with an empty stomach either because then you're thinking about wanting to eat. Uh, and so having a nice balance there is important. Yeah, that, that important not to overeat. But I find one of the main things that keeps me from falling asleep, yeah. if I'm noticing I'm not, I can't fall asleep, is I'm hungry. And there's actually a direct uh, mechanistic reason for that, that when you're hungry, your body releases uh, this hormone called ghrelin. And mm -hmm. ghrelin actually directly, um, uh, it can activate the lateral hypothalamus, which is the main brain region that wakes you up and keeps you awake. So having a little bit of food uh, or at least just not being hungry when you're trying to go to sleep can also be beneficial. But there are health uh, benefits to not eating before you go to sleep. So there's a little bit of conflict there, but <laughs> I, I prefer to, to eat a little bit before I go to bed. Awesome. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you everyone for all of the, the comments in the chat and for staying engaged, uh, for listening, right? We're, uh, we're going to start doing kind of super thanks and super chat. So if you guys kind of during these live streams want to just kind of throw us a little bit of support, uh, every little bit kind of adds up and helps us keep the momentum and keep doing this. Uh, but we, we just, we very much appreciate all of the support. This is one of the coolest and funnest things that I look forward to every couple of weeks. Uh, we love doing the research for this because it keeps us just motivated to learn everything about the brain, right? Uh, instead of hyper-focusing on just this one thing, like we're really trying to synthesize a lot of these ideas and bring them together and hopefully allow you to gain a little bit more insight into, into how your own brain works that you can make better decisions about your life. Perfect. Yeah. And I just, <clears throat> I threw up the, uh, the <laughs> other QR code for our Patreon. If you guys want to scan that QR code with your phone. You can go there and support us for as little as a dollar a month. Like Taylor said, every little bit helps, helps us to continue to produce these episodes and do more of them in the future. Um, so thank you all so much for watching, for being here. Don't forget to like and subscribe and yeah, uh, yeah see you next time, I guess. And uh, buy a sticker and put it on your water bottle. <laughs> That's right. Check out the store. <laughs> cool stuff. Awesome. Right. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time. See ya.